thank you, Neil, for inviting me. And uh, I'm going to just focus on the neurogenesis component for the first 15 minutes. The second 15 minutes, we're going to talk about the impact of this kind of agent, uh, psilocybin, on learning, hippocampal-dependent learning. Uh, and that's being uh, delivered to you by the person who did the, all the work, uh, Dr. Bryony Catlaw, who was my graduate student at the time. And I'd been trying to get students to do this kind of work for a long time. And I was able to fund it through my research endowment. And uh, she did beautiful work. So, And she's now at the Lieber Institute for Brain Development. Her mentor now is uh, Ron Mackay, who is a pioneer in neurogenesis. Um, and so she's going to go very far having this kind of environment to do research. Uh, hopefully she'll eventually take up the lead on following through on these kinds of studies. Uh, now, it's a caveat, a warning here. Everyone here probably knows the real value of psilocybin, I mean, what we believe to be the value of, of altering perceptions, uh, perhaps opening your uh, consciousness to other realities, uh, creating a mystical state. Uh, it's class as a hallucinogen. A lot is known about some of its mechanism of action, but I'm not going to be speaking about that. As a scientist who wants to find therapeutic applications in Western medicine, there's certain things that we have to do. And so we have very simple-minded questions. And we use preclinical animal models. So it may seem kind of boring. Why is he doing this? I volunteer. You can study learning in me. You know, I have a lot of people who've said that. So that's what you have to understand. This is animal work, uh, very simple-minded questions. And the first question is, what impact does psilocybin have on the hippocampus, which is one of the privileged niches, microenvironments of the brain, where new neurons are born throughout life. Uh, and here you can see what a neuron is. A neuron is just a brain cell that's very, very uh, important in communicating between other neurons, and it's responsible for everything that goes on in our brain, everything that goes on in our nervous system. And neurons don't act alone, of course. They're whole networks and they're supportive cells and astroglia and microglia and so forth. But it was Ramon y Cajal, a Spanish neuroanatomist, who, who came up with the idea that the brain isn't just a, a, a big network, but it actually is made up of individual units that create the network. And that was called the neuron doctrine. And one of the things he said, now he studied uh, the development of the nervous system in chicks in his own laboratory in his kitchen. And he used indie ink stains and he drew all the pictures. That's one of the pictures he did. And you can see the cell body right here. And this incredible dendritic tree and all of the, and, and, and what was fascinating, he claimed, he, he came up with the other doctrine that once adults has developed and you lose a neuron because neurons become damage in their loss as we age, and in various conditions, neurological, neurodegenerative diseases, you can't replace them. That whole doctrine has been completely changed, and we know that there is neurogenesis, or the birth of new neurons throughout life in several privileged areas. So uh, evidence that uh, neurogenesis occurs in the adult brain was demonstrated as early as 1965. And, it, and initially, people were focusing on animals. But it was shown also to occur in humans. And the way that study was done is to give in a terminally, uh, terminal cancer patient who volunteered to receive what's uh, a, a, a pseudo base like called uh, uh, BRDU, bromodeoxyuridine, which is taken up by all cells that are dividing. It's actually used to stage cancer cells. But it's been used now to label cells that are being, that are proliferating. So it's taken up by any nucleus in a cell throughout the body that is undergoing proliferation. And then if you wait a certain amount of time, that basically birth dates when a cell was born. The times you give the injections, or he took it orally, every cell that was dividing was labeled. And you can visualize it after death. So when he died, they looked at BRDU distribution in his brain. And what they found that by a double labeling technique, the BRDU labeled cells also express proteins expressed seen only in neurons, which meant that that neuron was derived from a cell that was born 
at the time he got the BRD. So that's how you demonstrate it in humans. It always is after the fact, post-mortem. There's no way that we can in vivo study neurogenesis, though so there's all kinds of, in the future, I think it will be possible. So this is the privileged areas I'm speaking about. There's this hippocampus, so I'll tell you a bit more about it. And this is a rodent brain and the ventricular wall. Throughout life in adult rodents, there's birth of new neurons here and birth of new neurons here. Here they migrate to the olfactory bulb and replace neurons that are died. So there's a turnover. Cells are born, make their synaptic connections with other neuronal uh, systems, and then they die. And with aging, that capacity diminishes. So the, why is it called the hippocampus? Because supposedly the uh, neuroanatomists are kind of whimsical. They thought it looked like a seahorse. This is the hippocampus. It's deep in the temporal lobe. It doesn't look like a seahorse to me, but that's how the privilege of neuroanatomy. In the mouse, it's uh, located up dorsally, and it has two components. Uh, this is the dentate gyrus. It looks like a tooth. And in the subgranular zone of the dentate gyrus, right here, is where the new neurons are born. Now, these cells received innervation from the enterhinal cortex, the association area of the brain. They project to CA3, which is a region of the hippocampus. I'm just showing you the network and back out to the enterhinal cortex. So in this, there's a, a loop that uh, is very much in, involved in the formation of new memories and in the recall of new memories, of, of old memories. So I'll just do this very quickly. This is the neurogenic micro niche. This is that dentate gyrus called the granular zone. And underneath are where new neurons are born. They migrate, extend neurites, and make connections. Now, we know now there are many, many factors that regulate neurogenesis in the adult. Things that increase neurogenesis or the formation of new neurons include environmental enrichment, uh, physical activity. In fact, uh, good cardioaerobic exercises not only enhances cognitive function, but it's probably associated with enhanced neurogenesis. Uh, paradoxically, injuries result, for example, ischemia or seizures will increase neurogenesis in hippocampus too. And trauma, antidepressants, and we're going to focus on that, especially the serotonin uptake inhibitors, like the classic Prozac, Prozac selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, enhance neurogenesis. Um, Chronic haloperidol will also, which is a dopamine receptor antagonist, can increase neurogenesis. And that's kind of, we're going to talk a bit more about what this really means to enhance neurogenesis, whether it's a good thing or a bad thing. When I say good, what's its function to have increased neurogenesis? What is, and then there are all kinds of things that decrease neurogenesis. So stress and stero corticosteroids, depression, aging, irradiation, alcohol, psychostimulants, and opiates. So... It turns out that serotonin, 5-hydroxytryptamine, is involved in the regulation of neurogenesis, one of the, the key neurotransmitters. There are many others uh, that are involved, but this is one that we're studying. And high levels of 5-hydroxytryptamine are increased in this, increase the survival of birth-dated BRDU cells in the dentate gyrus. So this study has been done where they give uh, uh, this antidepressant, and you can see increased uh, proliferation. This is, uh, I forget which author this is, but uh, maybe Brian will remember. So you can see that fluoxetine increases the birth of BRDU-labeled neurons in the dentate gyrus. Electroconvulsive uh, 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 ECS, I'm sorry. No, estimated... 14 days of treatment, too. Chronic antidepressant therapy, that's what that is. So with chronic antidepressant therapy, you see this increase in neurogenesis and with single doses as well. Uh, so the, the receptors, there are many kinds of serotonin receptors involved in the regulation of neurogenesis. And the 5-H2A are probably the most important ones. They're very abundant in the hippocampus. They stimulate the phosphoinositol pathway, leads to PKC, now, some of these agents that stimulate the 5-H2A are considered to be hallucinogenic. So psilocybin, actually the active metabolite of psilocybin, psilocin, which is a phosphorylated psilocybin, we call it PSOP. And there's another one, um, 
that was synthesized, very highly selective 5-H2A agonist uh, called NBOME, which is a dimethoxyphenethylamine uh, complicated structure uh, in terms of the name. That was made by uh, Dave Nichols at Purdue for us. He had, uh, we asked him for the most, the most selective 5-H2A agonist that he had. And so what I'm going to show you is our studies of, uh, done by Briney of this silicin, the phosphorylated uh, metabolite. And you all know it comes, it's found in this magic mushroom in very many varieties of this. So we, the, what we looked at is the effect of acute, various acute doses of psilocybin and of a PSOP and intermittent administration, as well as the effect of an antagonist of a 5H2AC antagonist called ketanserine. And the, the protocol for doing this, so you understand when I, how we measure neurogenesis to make it very clear how simple-minded this really is, is that the drug is given either as a single dose in the acute studies, and for four days subsequently, the animal is given BRDU injections. BRDU, as I mentioned, is going to label or birth date any cell that's proliferating. In other words, DNA synthesis is going on, so it'll be labeled. And then if you wait two weeks, you can see what the fate of that birth dated cell is. It takes about two weeks for a cell, a, a, a neural stem cell, to actually differentiate into a mature neuron. So then we sacrifice the animal, or euthanasia, at two weeks and do this double staining technique, which I'll show you in a moment. The other um, protocol was to give the drug once a week at various doses, but I think for this report we only gave one dose once a week, and we followed by BRDU. Uh, so the BRDU was given at 2, 9, 16, and 23 days. So, so every time they got uh, the psilocin, we made sure there was BRDU around so we could label any cells that are undergoing proliferation. And how you visualize, now this is the uh, neurogenesis, and then count the birth of new neurons, is by doing a double immunohistofluorescent technique. So after the animals are, are, uh, are euthanized, they're anesthetized, euthanized, brain is removed, very thin sections, they're stained with antibodies to NUN, and NUN is a protein marker of a mature neuron. And this is very low power here. So you see all these, these greens are dense. This is the granular zone of the dentate gyrus. In the subgranular zone, we can see BRDU. We have antibodies against BRDU so that with a different marker, a red fluorescent marker. So each of these dots you see here is a birth dated cell. And by looking at the cells that are both double labeled, like you can see this one here, it's like yellowish, it's r green and red. Well, we can really prove that by doing confocal microscopy, which I'm not showing here. And then using stereological techniques, you count the number of BRDU labeled cells per the hippocampus, per mouse, and the number of double labeled new N neurons that were born at the time soon after we gave the psilocybin. So that's a technique, and here's a, a higher power where you see both new N and BRDU, and you can see the, the newborn neurons here. This one's already migrating up into the granular zone. So what was the effect? Then we get to the results here. So if you give saline and look at BRDU here, BRDU is just telling you how many cells were dividing in the subgranular zone at the time we gave the drug. And we started with very low doses, 0.1 milligrams per kilogram, to as high a dose as one milligram per kilogram. Now, does this drug affect their behavior? Did these drugs hallucinate, uh, these mice hallucinate? They look completely normal. You, you wouldn't be able to, they're not like uh, in a catatonic state like what happened if you gave really big doses, uh, where, which you might surmise would be associated with really big changes in, in, in perception. So this is an effect. These, these animals don't show any change in behavior at all. Locomotor activity, they act normal. But you can see that the highest dose resulted in de decreased proliferation in the subgranular zone. And if you look at double-labeled cells here, these are BRDU cells that were birth dated that went on to differentiate into mature neurons. You see there's kind of a trend towards an increase with a low dose, but it didn't reach statistical significance. But with the higher dose, there was a decrease. 
So at the low dose, it looks like there's a trend towards an increase in neurogenesis, but we rely on statistics. I think there are at least six to eight animals, I don't recall, and, and that's how it turned out. Uh, when we gave the really potent agonist that is very selective, at every dose we gave, 0.1 to 1, there was suppression of proliferation. And what's missing here are the effects of the really tiny doses. The KD, or association constant for this drug, is really, really, it's an extremely potent drug. It would be more like an LSD type. So we really should have gone much lower doses, and maybe we would have seen a trend towards an increase at lower doses, but we didn't at the time. And in terms of the birth of new neurons, well, this drug didn't actually like the psilocybin or metabolite. It depressed the birth of new neurons in the hippocampus. Um, ketanserin, which blocks that receptor, also suppresses. We just use that one dose. And you see a decrease in proliferation of neural progenitor cells and a decrease in the birth and the development of new neurons there. So the repeated doses were of interest to me because one of the uh, if you give it every day, tolerance develops, but if you give it once a week, and we gave low doses once a week, uh, well, from 0.5 up to 1 milligram, up to 1.5 milligrams per kilogram of PSOP, and what you see is a gradual dose-dependent increase in the rate of proliferation when these animals are given for four weeks in a row, these doses from 0.5 to 1. But it wasn't statistically significant. But if you gave ketanserin chronically, it continued to suppress uh, the proliferation of cells. What was interesting, if you look at double-labeled cells, in other words, the birth of new neurons, at the highest dose given once a week, now 1.5 milligrams per kilogram, we saw an increase in neurogenesis, but didn't see any effect on neurogenesis with, with the uh, ketanserin. So I'll summarize here, and then I'll introduce uh, Briny. Uh, so acute effects of PSOP, the metabolite of psilocybin or psilocin, uh, decreased neurogenesis. Uh, but, and so did the 5H2A antagonist. Although there was a kind of a trend for increased neuro, uh, neurogenesis with uh, low doses of PSOP given acutely. With the repeated intermittent administration, we saw an increase in neurogenesis uh, with the 1.5 milligrams per kilogram. So we wanted to know what does that have to do with anything? What does it have to do with learning? And that's where Briny is going to come up. As I mentioned, Briny is by far the best student I've had. Uh, she was not only amazingly um, excellent attention to detail, but uh, uh, was kind of brave to undertake this as a project. Luckily, her other mentor in psychology was also interested in drug uh, dependence issues. So we were allowed to have that as a PhD project. So Bryony, can you come up? And she'll explain what this means. I just gave you the impact on neurogenesis. Hi there. So um, Zeno gave a really nice kind of introduction into the importance of uh, neurogenesis that occurs in the hippocampus. And I'm going to talk a little bit more of a practical side of how the hippocampus influences learning. So this is the major structure in the brain that actually promotes learning and memory and connects with other brain regions to help you know, keep, keep subjects in mind and then remember them later. So this has been shown over many, many decades actually, and particularly what I'm going to highlight here is that the, um, not just the hippocampus, but neurogenesis in the hippocampus is critical for certain tasks. So there are different kinds of learning tasks. Some of them are pretty easy, like if you put uh, an animal in a water maze and you have to let it you know, learn an escape pattern so it will be able to um, get out of the maze. This is something like what we did, which I'm going to talk about today, which is a trace conditioning paradigm, which requires very selective attention, and it's quite a difficult task. So with this particular task, if you lesion the hippocampus, animals can't learn. And actually, if you um, wipe out neurogenesis using a selective agent called MAM, then the animals also don't learn this particular task. So wiping out neurogenesis 
they can learn other tasks, but not the selective trace conditioning task. And uh, Zeno's already talked about um, serotonin agonist increasing neurogenesis in the hippocampus, so I'll just skip to the data, straight into um, what we did. So there's basically three phases of this conditioning paradigm, uh, habituation, training, and then the final test. So learning in this paradigm is assessed by the animal actually freezing, so it's kind of different on the evolutionary scale to humans. Um, there, in this particular task, the immobility is, uh, is the, the, the unconditioned response um, that shows that they're going to learn. So the objective here was to actually pair a particular tone with um, uh, an unconditioned response to elicit the, the learned response. So we start out by just getting the animal used to the environment. So this is habituation period, and you record their motor activity for about five minutes, and they stay in this environment for 30 minutes. And this little white ball, this is where the tone is coming from. And the bars on the bottom are actually, they deliver a very small shock, which you'll see in a minute. So then the next day, they come back, and we put them in and we train them. We actually get them to make the association between the unconditioned stimulus and the conditioned stimulus. So what happens here is that they receive a 15 minute, um, 100 decibel tone, so it's quite loud. And then there's a, an interval between the, the, the conditioned stimulus and then the shock that they get, which is a half a second. It's something like when you get an electrical shock when you open the car door or something like that. I've done it myself many times. It's uh, not too bad. So here's going through the procedure. And so they do this 10 times. And the idea is that after repeated associations, then with the tone itself, they're going to show this learned response and will um, signify that the animal has actually learned the task. So what we did was we gave um, these different drugs in a dose response acutely, not repeatedly, like we did with the neurogenesis component. And then we tested you know, their activity in these different paradigms. So the context test is actually just putting them back in the environment and um, seeing how they respond to the environment after they've just been shocked in this environment, right? So they, the obvious answer is that they're going to be inactive in this environment because they've already been shocked in that environment. But the actual really difficult component of this task is getting them to make the association with the tone, and this is called the Q test. So whether or not the, the noise itself is going to elicit a freezing response. And we had looked specifically at the different uh, temporal elements of this task to see when exactly they were freezing. And um, these are the different measures here. So immobility during the condition stimulus, during the trace, and after the trace. So the idea is that during and after the trace, they should show a higher freezing response. So here you can see that um, all the mice acquired the pairings, so they all learned the task. And that is most easily seen by looking at the black bars. So on the x-axis, you have saline with the different doses of psilocybin and the antagonist. And immobility during the condition stimulus is on the y-axis. So all the black bars are high, meaning on trial three, they, they froze less, uh, they froze more, sorry, so they were increased in immobility. Versus on the first trial, they didn't expect to get the shock, so they were um, normally active. And this is during the trace. So um, when we put them back into the environment the next day after they've learned the task, then um, you can see the big difference here between um, habituation, which is in the white bars, and the actual context test. So this is post-learning. And the, the high percent immobility is a demonstration that all the mice are actually learning. And we don't see a dose response here. We don't see an effect of psilocybin, which means that all of the animals that were given um, different drug treatments responded equally to this particular paradigm. And in the Q-test, we saw um, here and there little effects of psilocybin. So for instance, um, saline were more immobile during the conditioned stimulus in this treatment. And then during the trace, some of the moderate doses of psilocybin showed a, a lower response, but there was an overall effect of psilocybin decreasing um, immobility during the task, which would mean that there's a, an alteration in learning in this particular paradigm. So when we pull that out and we look um, at the, 
after the trace period, so when they were supposed to be getting the shock and they didn't get the shock, then you can see that the psilocybin animals that received the low doses actually decreased percent immobility um, compared to the other treatments, whereas the antagonist increased immobility. So that's kind of best demonstrated in this figure here, which goes out across the entire 10 trials. And if you follow the black bar, you can see the saline treatment. So this is a normal response. So the animals that didn't receive, um, that were just the control animals, they were immobile in the task, meaning they were extremely fearful of the tone and the environment itself for the entire period. They never extinguished the response, which is in stark contrast to the psilocybin-treated animals, especially the low doses you can see in the blue bars that are um, intermittent, that by the third trial, their response had completely changed compared to the first trial, and this was something that was consistent out to the full 10 trials. So this to us means that there's some kind of relearning process going on, that there is sort of an increased kind of plasticity and ability to adapt to a task. And this is the opposite with the antagonist. So this, this finding for us is pretty exciting and really um, something that we are very interested in following up on. So just to kind of summarize the big picture here, psilocybin enhances the adaptation to the absence of the unconditioned stimulus and uh, the extinction is facilitated by the drug treatment, by the psilocybin treatment. So the reason why this is interesting is because plasticity in the hippocampus is critical for learning and memory. And there are a lot of different factors that have altered plasticity in the hippocampus, growth factors being some of the major components. Um, and we know that uh, different agonists to uh, serotonin system, like DOI for one, actually and, uh, it decreases BDNF mRNA, but other agonists for serotonin increase uh, BDNF mRNA expression in the hippocampus. So we also know that serotonin receptors, particularly the 5-HT2A, which is the target of psilocybin, is involved in temporal encoding. So this is the actual um, task where you have a space and time where you have to keep a particular um, stimulus in mind. And we believe that this is happening through um, different cell-cell connections, particularly um, with the GABAergic interneurons that form synapses with these progenitor cells and continue to get them to populate. So the results of this particular study really um, it raise a possibility and, and implicate the 5-HT2A receptor in hippocampal dependent learning and memory. And there's been no other tasks that have done this uh, so far. And we really are keen on, on following this up with some more um, studies involving receptor expression and different aspects of neurogenesis. So this is a lot of work from a lot of different people, particularly um, Dr. sanchez Roma's lab. So thank you. So I would like to ask you uh, if you could give some ideas why these changes should be positive and not negative. The, well, the ability to extinguish, to adapt to a change in the paradigm, like the removal of that unconditioned stimulus, the shock, the animals that are treated with psilocybin learn very quickly. And it may, from my view, this might be very useful in treatment of post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, so that's one of the, the possible implications. But the exact relationship between this learning paradigm and what we showed in the neurogenesis component still has to be refined because as you saw, increased neurogenesis uh, was seen only at very low doses intermittently. And I, I'm sorry, at 1.5 milligrams per kilogram given once a week, we saw increased neurogenesis. But for this uh, paradigm of learning, it was just one dose and it was various, uh, it was just what dose would did we use? Yeah, so we use the lower doses. So we don't know if this ability to extinguish, to adapt to the change in the conditions is really related to hippocampal neurogenesis. It still has to be worked out. I think uh, the research that you've done is very interesting and it's got a lot of clinical therapeutic potential, but how, how do you study neurogenesis in humans? without, you know, cutting their heads off? Well, that's the problem. We really can't study neurogenesis in a human. Um, there may be, there's supposedly some new functional MRI imaging technique 
that can look at the total mass of new uh, proliferating cells in hippocampus. That has a long way to go. And so you have an in vivo measure using some kind of PET scan measure, positron emission tomography, to do in vivo. But for now, it's the therapeutic application should be tested at least without having to rely on neurogenesis. The reason we picked neurogenesis is that's what our lab was doing. And, and there was evidence that serotonin uptake inhibitors enhance neurogenesis, and that the lifting of depression correlated with the birth of new neurons. It takes at least two weeks. So from my point of view, I thought it would be really interesting to see how a very fairly selective uh, 5H2A and, uh, agonist would impact neurogenesis. So there's really uh, no way that you can study neurogenesis in an adult human being, in, in, in a human being. Yeah, just uh, sort of related to Dr. Passi's uh, question, uh, I, I would uh, certainly think that, um, you know, by uh, uh, altering uh, the thresholds that you're talking about, um, you know, that you could see certainly um, problematic and beneficial uh, cases depending on a, a wide number of things. I mean, uh, we would all be in a lot of trouble if extinction never happened and there was only acquisition learning. So it's, you know, as I'm sure you know, you know, this fine balancing act, but uh, what we need to quote unquote forget um, or extinguish um, mm -hmm. versus what we need to hold on to. So as an example of that with psychedelics, it makes me think of what we would call the, um, delusion. Um, you might be sort of uh, increasing the hair trigger to see connections between things that you normally wouldn't see connections with in some cases, that might be good. In some cases, that might fall into what we call delusion. So anyway, just to comment. Yeah, that's a good point. That's good. Uh, so what I really would like to be able to see is the, the use of psilocybin in, say, veterans that have post-traumatic stress disorder. There's a tremendous number of people coming back. And there should be some kind of clinical trial, because we know it's safe. Yeah, so that's kind of what I would like to see as a next step. But in parallel to that, we need to do a lot more preclinical uh, uh, research. Thank you. I was just wondering on that slide where you had ECS written, whether it could have stood for endocannabinoid system as one of the um, well, you mitigators know, for neuroprotection. Well, the ECS was the chronic, uh, it was electroconvulsive shock. OK. It was shock, yeah. OK. And, and, and that also is an antidepressant, and it results in increased neurogenesis. But seizures in general will often result in increased neurogenesis. And I'll, someone told me, if you just breathe on, on these animals, you can have increased neurogenesis. There's a lot of things. That's why I don't want to, I emphasized it because we're looking at neurogenesis in, under various conditions. For example, in my lab in Alzheimer's disease. Um, so, but I don't think that's going to be the answer to a lot of our, our questions about psilocybin and its therapeutic uh, applications. Oh, yeah, the cannabis, yeah. Cannabis also enhances neurogenesis. Yeah, but it makes you forget. You know, it enhances forget. But forgetfulness is actually important. If you can't forget things, you're in trouble. So, so it enhances extinction in a sense, but, and it's associated with increased neurogenesis. So there's a lot of work to be done there. Uh, you mentioned that this might have some clinical efficacy in PTSD treatment. I was wondering um, if you thought this might have any implications for uh, the treatment of addiction, so extinguishing uh, memories associated with, say, triggers. I think it's another great application. In fact, you know, LSD has been studied pretty extensively as a treatment, as an adjunct to treatment of, of opiate dependence, and uh, probably psilocybin as long as well as other similar agents would be helpful and have tremendous therapeutic uh, potential. Certainly for drug dependence, yeah, I think that would be another application. And uh, the thing that I think will be helpful is not necessarily, I mean, there's various ways to use uh, psilocybin in related substances. One is to really alter consciousness and explore all kinds of things with uh, psychotherapy guided imagery and so forth and work out problems almost as a psychotherapeutic uh, approach and that would require higher doses what used to be called psycholytic doses what I'm talking about is the use of psilocybin at low intermittent chronic dosing where there may not be much alteration of perception that's kind of a would be more acceptable to regulatory agencies if you're giving doses that don't alter 
their sense of reality, um, you know. Do you have any evidence that you're, um, as to whether you're eliminating declarative memory as opposed to the association between memory and affect? Repeat that again. Think well, about it. are you are you eliminating memory? I mean, in terms of your experimental evidence, can you tell if you're eliminating memory per se, or the linkage between an emotional state and memory? It's a very good question, and I think so much of me, things that are remembered are linked to an affect, an emotional reaction. So I think it's very intricately related. So I don't know how to answer it. But the animals, uh, well, as you, as you noticed, uh, when they were put into the context again, they were able already to have decreased freezing. So they already began to kind of forget the noxious associations which is very, for me, it's a, quite an intriguing observation. Um, I think it's interesting the uh, BDNF, increase in transcription of BDNF. Uh, so is there any research uh, with serotonin agonists uh, having to do with, well, I guess you were talking about neural plasticity, but actually showing that you're getting an increase in synaptic activity, like some markers that are stained after continuous doses or acute doses. And also with BDNF, it's a, the neural guidance factor. So basically, with your BDNF, I mean your BRDU stains, do you see uh, in, in the cortex more migration of new neurons or well, any new cells? In terms of BDNF release, we had actually done with another student who didn't follow up on it. You know, we didn't present this data, but it was a cell culture method where we added PSOP and other serotonin um, uh, uh, antidepressants, basically, uh, serotonin uptake inhibitors. And we saw increased levels of BDR, BDNF released, measured by in the cell culture medium. So we, we, we think that activation of the 5H2A, 5H2A predominantly uh, receptor does result in increased expression of BDNF. In terms of migration of newborn neurons, we didn't really see any BR. You can see BRDU labeling in endothelial cells that are always kind of proliferating, and maybe in some astrocytes. But we focused really on the hippocampus, and where we could do very careful counting uh, to, to estimate the total number of newborn neurons. In the subventricular zone, you can, but that we didn't we didn't measure it there. But you're absolutely right, especially in the rodent. What happens in humans, and this has been done by looking at post-mortem tissue, uh, or tissue sampled during surgery, like epilepsy surgery. They took a guy named Alvarez Buya from UCSD San Francisco, took regions of the subventricular zone in adults, adult human brain, and cultured them and saw that you could generate neural progenitors. And in vitro, they become neurons, astrocytes, regardless where you take it from the subventricular zone. Like the whole layer, sub-layer of the ventricles, um, sub-ventricular layer, uh, allows proliferation of progenitors. But in vivo, what happens, if you look, they usually become astrocytes. So whenever there's an injury to brain, there's increased proliferation, increased BRDU. And then if you look in at over time, say someone who's had traumatic brain injury or a stroke, you'll see the BRDU-labeled cells, but they express mostly uh, GFAP, glial fibrillary acidic protein. So the normal fate for subventricular uh, cell neuroprogenitor proliferation, the fate is to become an astrocyte. So you end up with a lot of glial scarring, and it requires proliferation of, throughout the whole ventricular zone. They migrate. And the same with the spinal cord, the subependymal zone and periaqueductal uh, zone. They proliferate, nesting expressing, they become astrocytes. The, the really possible therapeutic application there is to drive them into neuronal fates, and we don't know how to do that quite. I'll just I'll add one more thing about that with the, um, you're asking about how it affects synaptic plasticity, and there's a, a lot of interest now in this particular receptor because there's an antidepressant treatment that targets this receptor. Um, and there's a lot of groups that are starting to investigate this, but as far as we know, there's no one that's actually looked at um, agonist of this receptor and then assess plasticity. So, but I, I think that Zeno is looking for some more people in his lab, so. And, uh, and, and funding, it's, it's hard. And funding. Zeno, thank you. Brandy, thank you very much.